And as you can uh, see, the theme for our symposium is shame and honor, gospel proclamation in a majority world. Different cultures have different lenses in which they can see the gospel penetrate effectively through different lens. And uh, scholars have uh, noted that uh, at least, I mean, there are many ways in which we can uh, describe this, but uh, the cultural lens that we can kind of summarize is uh, through these three lenses, the guilt, innocent, shame, honor, or fear, power. We're not saying that you have to pick only one. All of us has to deal with our guilt, shame, and fear. And our symposium this year focused on the shame and honor lens in which we get to tell them the gospel as you have heard here. And what would be an effective dimension for the gospel to penetrate depends on the culture in which you are trying to reach. And the majority worlds, I'm beginning with the New Testament, uh, all the way to today, uh, many parts of the world, the socio evaluation uh, is through the lens of shame and honor. And so for us to ignore this cultural lens as we proclaim the gospel, we might have missed an opportunity to proclaim the gospel effectively. And so uh, to introduce our keynote, I would like to uh, invite Dr. Ilowski back to the podium here. Well, good to be with you again. Um, uh, you know, and I had talked in my uh, tribute to Laman uh, just about how much he would have loved to be here, but God has also provided for us a wonderful speaker and my colleague and friend, Abjar Baku. Uh, he came to our seminary in 2018, I believe it was, right? It seems like it's been forever, you know? No. Uh, he came from a Baylor University in Waco, Texas, where he served in several capacities, including most recently as a senior lecturer of Arabic literature, culture, and language. Uh, he holds a PhD from the Pontifical Institute of Arabic and Islamic Studies in Rome. Uh, he's also, uh, uh, and also the Silesian Pontifical University in Rome, that's right, where he also earned master's and bachelor's degrees as well. He's also earned a master's degree from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Islamic Studies. You've been in school a long time, yeah. Um, his original diploma in theology is from St. Ephraim Theological Seminary, I believe, right? Yeah. Uh, since he began his ministry as a Syrian Orthodox monk, right? I think I can safely say you are the only Syrian Orthodox monk I know, and I know a number of them, who is now a Missouri Synod pastor. So that's great. Yeah. Uh, he also received an honorary doctorate from this institution back in 2013. Uh, Dr. Baku's most recent publication is The Monk Encounters the Prophet, the story of the encounter between monk Bahira and Muhammad as it is recorded in the Syriac manuscript of Martin 259, right? And um, I was able to write a foreword for that uh, because I think it's a wonderful book and we'll be working on getting some more texts from Arabic uh, and translated into English, uh, especially Garzimus, right? Abjar is recognized as an expert in Arabic as well as Islamic studies at a time when such expert knowledge is desperately needed. Uh, one need only think about the recent bombings in Sri Lanka, right? Uh, he's a missionary, a pastor, a gentleman, a scholar, and a host of other things. Uh, but most importantly, he is a good friend and colleague who I invite now to come and speak to you and to welcome him warmly. The Lord be with you. It is a great honor and uh, heavy responsibility for me to be asked to do this 
uh, keynote speaker. And so uh, thank you for the organizing committee who uh, asked me to do this after uh, Dr. Uh, Senna passed away. Um, as you can see today is the message of the gospel in the cultural dominated by shame and honor. He was having a conversation with a Central Asian taxi driver about God. And there was an open door to share the gospel. So he said something like, your sins make you guilty before God. But Jesus died so your sin could be forgiven. And you could escape punishment. The driver's eyebrows bunched up as if he is listening to an entirely different language. At that moment, Jason realized that his explanation of the gospel did not resonate emotionally and connectively in the heart of the driver from Central Asia. The reason is because the driver hardly sensed personal guilt for wrongdoing, or he was not seeking personal forgiveness. Second, the courts in Central Asia are notoriously corrupt. So using legal language such as guilt, restitution, judge, to explain how God saves people sounded strange to him. That conversation motivated Jason to learn more about how to present the gospel to a non-Western culture. And that's what the goal of this whole symposium. So in my message today, I will attempt to define uh, honor-shame culture from a contrasting position of the typical Western-based culture. Second, I will critically look at the Western church mission experience in honor-shame culture. And lastly, I will offer some practical suggestions of how to share the gospel in honor-shame culture. Westerners are by nature individualistic. In West, we tend to view our action in light of law and logic. When a Westerner violates either internal or external moral or legal law, he or she may experience guilt. This guilt is an internal experience and does not require another person to ascribe it. In these instances, the violation of the law typically affect only those who violate the law. For example, when an American knows that he is guilty of a violation, he will seek to be justified via repentance or restitution. If this is achieved and recognized by the giver or the keeper of the law, then the American has been forgiven. He experiences an individualistic and internal feeling of being innocent. This type of culture does not require any cooperating group to assign guilt or innocence. The primary goal of this type of view is to ensure that rules are followed. If one knows the rule, then he knows how he should or should not behave. Eastern culture, which are much more focused on the group, are in contrast to Western guilt, innocence, culture. Honor-shame culture have social interrelationships that are necessary in life. Thus, when an individual has been put to shame, there is very little this person can do by himself or by herself to remove that shame. The reason because in the East, the we is much more important than me. To this end, one's identity is tied directly to the group. The closest analogy that one might draw from the West is sport. You know how important it is, sport here. 
Yeah, up to now, half of the American sport, I don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> For example, the best basketball team might have one or two players who are more talented than the rest of the team. However, if this team hope to succeed, each person must take on a new identity as assigned by the team and leave it out while they are part of the team. The Eastern cultural paradigm have a complex social system of protocols that tend to maintain harmony with the community. For example, in Japan, one of the dominant social system is that of WA, W-A. Under the system of WA, the Japanese people recognize that each person has their own wants, desire, personal test. However, it is best for each person within the community to want the same basic things. One of the motivators for a living under WA is another important system called Oshi Soto, which literally mean in or out. That's different from the hamburger in and out from California. <laughs> in or out. Its purpose is to display to the group who truly belong and who truly does not belong. The person who belongs to the group and follow the protocol is the one who is saving or building up face, which means saving or building up honor. Those who do not desire to belong to the group are branded as soto, which means they are out of the group and are bringing shame to the group. In China, those who seem to have no desire to save face are branded as being dangerous and highly immoral because the, these type of people are viewed to be sources of social destruction. This same paradigm is, practic is practiced in the Arabic Middle Eastern culture. Muslim and Christian share the same feature. The group identity dominates the individual identity. Similar to the Japanese and Chinese expression of saving or building face, Arab use two expressions. Number one is when you bring shame to the group, you are, the verb is sawwad al wajh, which is making the face of the group dark. Or another expression is ras, lowering or putting down the head of the group. When you bring honor to the group, you are bayyad al wajah, making the face of the group shining. Or you are raising up or elevating the head of the group. So when I left the Syrian Orthodox Church as a monk, the whole community was looking at me to lead this community, to be the face of this community, and to become a bishop that my dad and mom will be proud of. And when I left and decided to get married, that's what I heard. You lowered our head. That's the first thing I heard after almost a year when I left. My mom called me and said, you know, you lowered our head. You darkened our face. Imagine that just because I left the community. Even though they know I am now with a different church body, but I still, I am the outsider. I am the one who darkened the face and lowered the head of the community. I don't represent the community anymore. I cannot represent the community. So this leads us to the danger of shame. Let me briefly talk about the danger of shame. Shame has a significant theological and practical importance. In fact, the whole Bible was written in a culture dominated by shame and, and honor. Paul spent the entire second letter of Timothy attempting to preclude Timothy's own growing sense of shame. 
Time will not permit me to talk about it, but in our breakout session later afternoon, I will present in details how Paul dealt with the issue of shame in his second letter to Timothy. But let me briefly give you three spiritual and psychological danger of shame. Number one, shame kills change and brings fear. Shame concerns a person's identity, not, not only one's action. It leaves a permanent mark on a person's heart and soul. Shame says, I am unworthy of love. It scars the heart and mind that a person defines himself or herself by that sense of shame. Consequently, shame instills fear. It whispers, I cannot change. I will always be unworthy of others' acceptance. A person entrapped in the prison of shame experiences waves upon waves of memories that reinforces the feeling of unworthiness, unacceptance, unlovable. Every glimmer of hope and opportunity for change is pushed down by another memory of failure or rejection. Number two, shame fills the heart with grief. Shame produces grief and regret. A person feels such an intense grief that he cannot bear to face the reality of his own wrongdoing. As a result, a habit of denial emerges. The mind finds excuses and forges them into reason. By adding a little rationale, the mind reconstructs the past to the point that repentance and genuine remorse become difficult and in some way virtually impossible. And this is one of the ways we hide our shame. Think about many biblical figures like Judah. This is what happened to him. He could not get over that fear and guilt. Third, fear, grief, regret leads to anger. Anger stems from fear and the felt need to protect oneself. Ironically, such anger perpetuates the problem. Those who are enslaved by shame alienate other people. Relationships are poisoned. Family and friends distance themselves from the angry individual whose anger prevent others from showing them compassion. Shame thus create a vicious cycle which divides relationship and perpetuates a sense of fear, regret, grief, anger, withdrawal, and isolation. This is how dangerous it is when somebody is entrapped in, in shame. And that's what we see in many in many people, biblical figures. Let me talk a little bit about shame and honor about, uh, as a uh, global reality. Shame and honor is not only in the East. It is, it is becoming a global reality. In the 21st century, shame is not limited to non-Western context. Western, cult uh, Western culture is becoming more shame-oriented. Let's look at just a look at the conversation in the media will expose the, perm the prominence of shame within Western culture. Let me give you a couple examples. The issue of internet shaming is widely discussed by Brene Brown's top rated TED talk, which has over 30 million viewers. And that's the show. The same subject is widely and frequently discussed in the New York Times. No less than four separate Christian books released in 2016 carry the title Unashamed. And that's the global reality of shame. But the question is why shame and honor becomes a global issue? There are four worldwide phenomenon in the 21st century that are the reason shame and honor is becoming a global reality. Let me briefly also talk about these four global phenomenon. Number one, 
global culture types. Honor, shame is the dominant cultural type for most people in the world. And this is as indicated in this map uh, made by Global Mapping International. As you can see, you might not be able to read uh, the color, but you can see here the huge red spots, those are shame. And then the blue, which is the second after the, it is uh, guilt. And then those few green spots are fear. So this tells you how big is becoming the issue of shame and honor. Culture shapes people's experience of sin and notion of salvation. Therefore, Christian mission must account for this global predominance of honor-shame culture. Number two, and this is what just our president shared with us, that the future is for the immigration. American and European now encounters people from honor-shame culture. The surge of international students, refugees, immigrants has changed the face of Western population. Understanding honor and shame help Christians obey the great commandments of loving their neighbor from around the globe. Number three, global Christianity. An increasing number of Christians come from honor shame culture. This shift in global Christianity mandates ongoing contextualization. The global church needs to articulate a theology that equips majority world Christian to follow Jesus in their own socio-cultural context marked by honor, shame, reality. Number four, unreached people group. Honor and shame encompasses the cultural outlook of most people group who have limited or no access at all to the gospel. The geographic area known in missiological term as 1040 window. And as you can see also, I brought you another map with some animation. As you can see here, this is the 1040 window. The green is the Muslim, yellow is Hindu, red communist, orange Buddhist. You see how vast it is. This is what we are facing. They are not far away. They are here in the United States. They are our neighbor. Okay. A biblical missiology of honor-shame context is strategic for fulfilling the great com uh, commission among all nations. This global prominence of honor and shame requires fresh missiological reflection. And that's why we had this symposium every year, because we need to face this global reality. Let me, uh, let's look now at uh, the Western, how the Western church mission experience. I will critically look at the Western church mission experience. Ahmad Abdul Munaim is a brilliant Muslim student from Egypt. He arrived in United States just one month before 9-11. His goal was to complete his PhD and return to Egypt. During his stay in America, he was exposed to what we call evangelical Christians, who invited him to their churches and tried to convert him to Christianity. Ahmed write his reaction to the way Christian tried to convert him. And I am quoting what he wrote. One of, uh, one of those who tried to convert me asked me to explain to him why it is difficult for me to convert and get integrated into Christianity. Ahmad write, my response to him was, there are three major reasons. If you want to write it, it's not on PowerPoint. The reason is your message, number one, two, you the messenger, number three, me the receiver. So three important uh, reasons. You the message, your message, you the messenger, and me the receivers. 
Uh, this fall, I'm teaching a whole course about Muslim and the gospel, and we will work in details in these three major things. I'm not advertising for my courses here. Just, <laughs> just to show you, it's very important. It's very wild, and uh, and I will just summarize these three points in few lines or in a few minutes. Unfortunately, most of Western of our Western theology is written within a Western perspective. The language of our theology and understanding of scripture is not well suited to this culture. In other words, if we are to hope to reach people within Eastern culture, we need to be prepared to contextualize our message in a way that speaks to them and their perspectives of life. Let's go back to the conversation that Jason had with the taxi driver. Okay? Just I want you to forward back a few minutes the conversation. Jason presented the idea of sin that brings judgment of death on us. He employed legal language, or what is called the forensic view, view of salvation. Okay? The forensic view of salvation. What is forensic view of salvation? It goes like this. God is a judge. We stand guilty before him because of our sin. People of the East are oriented toward relationship. Honor, shame, culture are more concerned with the person's identity within a relationship in the community. The language Jason used is more geared toward avoidance of punishment. In his gospel presentation, Jason focused less on how the gospel impacts the driver's life. Therefore, the driver has difficulty hearing Jason's word. Let me go back again to Ahmed, the Egyptian student who came. He continued to talk about his difficulties of understanding the, 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 the message, the Christian message. Listen to what he said. You, your Christian message appeared to me as a foreigner message. It is foreigner in its vocabulary, foreigner in its content. You see things and explain them with legal terminology, as if we are in a court. You talk about guilt and righteousness, sin and its penalty, condemnation and justification. I have been shown the four spiritual laws, the bridges to life illustration, and steps to peace with God. They all follow logical syllogism and use legal terminology. My paradigm or lens through which I took I look at reality is not primarily that of guilt and righteousness, but that of shame and honor, clean and unclean, fear and power. When I talk with you, it feels like that it feels like you are laying a guilt trip on me. And then he pauses and he asks this question, which is a challenging for all of us. Listen to what he said. He said, Does your message have anything to say to me about my shame, my defilement, and my fear? Without a doubt, guilt, innocent presentation is affected by our Western exegesis that dominates our reading of scripture. We may notice that in a common interpretation of Romans 3.23, which is here. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, how our Western exegesis interpret this? Sin. They interpret it as a sin as missing the mark. I think in Greek, amartia. Or coming up short of perfectly obeying God's law. But that is not the full explanation. Paul equates sin with imperfectly and incompletely glorifying God. When we dig up the dirty root of human sinfulness and death, we will find that the hidden root is dishonoring and disobeying God. Adam and Eve didn't honor God, nor were they thankful, so they disobeyed his word. This is the pattern of all sinfulness. 
Paul explained it in the opening of his letter to the Roman, which is, goes like this. For although they knew God, they neither, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish heart were darkened. Fundamentally, the human problem is one of failing to glorify God as he deserves. John precisely put it in this way or defines sin as lawlessness. He goes, everyone who sin breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. So rather than contradicting Paul, this definition actually helps us see the link between honor and disobedience. When Adam failed to honor God, he transgressed the law. We dishonor by disobeying. In this same context, we can read Jesus' command. If you love me, keep my command, which is another way. If you honor me, obey me. And so this is one of the difficulties also using the language. Let's now move to the last part of this presentation, the sharing the gospel in honor, shame, culture. Number one, and some of our presenter talked about that. There is always the need to return to the basic apostolic kerygma. We have to go back to the basic. And what is the effectively, or what is the effective of going back to the basic? And I put it in two points. Number one, an encounter with authentic first-hand witness. We call it effect. Number two, a return to basic apostolic preaching as a fundamental schema in, in speaking to unbelieving world. The apostolic Charismatic proclamation of Jesus Christ as Savior of the world was characterized by, and I will mention four important points that help us see this sharing the gospel. Number one, their witness revolved around a simple and direct message that focused on the person of Christ, his powerful witness and message, the miraculous deed he worked, and the transformation of life as they lived in him and became his witness to the world. That's number one. Number two, they were considered credible witness because they had met, knew the person of Jesus and had formed a personal relationship with him. They were able to speak from their experience of their encounter with Jesus. In the word of John the evangelist, this is what he said. What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked upon, touched with our own hand, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you. That's, that's very powerful. Number three, their experience of salvation in Jesus Christ urged them to proclaim and share God's good news to all whom they met. They took to heart Peter's admonition that we should always be ready to render an account for the hope that is within us. And that's the title of my upcoming book. Number four, their preaching as history demonstrate bore tremendous fruits in the heart of those who came to believe because of them. Let me give you now a suggested presentation of the gospel. We saw how Ahmad had problem with what we call them the four spiritual law. Let me give you a, a different version of presenting the gospel in the shame and honor culture. Number one, God made us for relationship with him. Number two, we sinned and then broke the relationship we were intended to have. Number three, Jesus who is God and man came to heal that relationship through sacrificing his life, rising again, giving us what? The community of believers, which is his church. Number four, we have the opportunity to respond 
by confessing Jesus as our, our Lord and Savior. Now you might be asking, why did I choose this? Why did I choose this? And I will give you two reasons why I choose this outline. Number one, the foundation and the focus of, of this outline is community. As you can see, we were in community. And, and again, I come from Eastern Church. I, I can talk more and more about that. This is how Eastern Church spoke about that, about baptism. What is the baptism? Baptism is returning back to the paradise and fellowshipping with God. You read Ephraim the Syrian. What is the cross? The cross is that forbidden tree. Man has, uh, is able now to go back and, and eat from that fruit and fellowship, have meal with God. This is how I'm not coming with something new. The Eastern Church always focused on this version of presenting the gospel. So the foundation is the community. First, Eastern people need to see the community of God in action in our presentation of the gospel. The church principle must be sought in its nature as a living organism, not in its organizational expressions, just like our president shared with us this morning. And this is what our confession teaches also, the Augsburg Confession, the Luther Small and Large Catechism. This is when, when, when they define what is the church. We need to see it as a living organism. When we join community, we became what? Living members. And when we dishonor and disobey the community, we are dead to sin, living outside of God's community. A clear biblical illustration is what? The prodigal son. What happened to the prodigal son? He left the community. He joined different community. And he died. And then when he returned, what happened to him? He is back as a living member and full heir of the community. Okay? Second, people within honor shame culture are used to living a life attached to the local community in a public way. This fact correlates well to the notion that Christianity has always been intended to be a public faith. It is not coincidence that Jesus told his disciples to pick up their cross and follow him. And so crucifixion is a public and visible death. Number two, meeting people. The most important part of evangelism is meeting people. In honor shame culture, it is particularly important to form relational bridges that honor people. As we proclaim a God who removes shame and restores honor, we must embody that very language with our lives. Naturally, people will be more receptive to hearing about God's honor if, if they experience honoring interaction with us. Many times, people see the gospel as much as they hear the gospel. Therefore, our relational interaction with the people in honor shame culture are vital aspect of the evangelism process. For the last over 15 years, I have been working with Muslim. And through our ministry in Texas and here, over 16 Muslim came to Christ and they were baptized and disciples. All this came to Christ not because I was a fine theologian, I knew how to present the gospel. All these people came because we built relationship with them. We honored them, we helped them, we had meal with them, we were not afraid of them. And then conversation continued. Jesus also, two of Jesus' com uh, common relational bridges were what? Eating with people and miraculous healing. Eating with people and miraculous healing. Both acts removed social stigma and embodied the divine honor he taught about. Think about Zacchaeus. The Zacchaeus was a bad guy. Nobody, even if you say hi to him, 
They're going to say, why, why do you greet that guy? He is, he is a thief. He is stealing money. And Jesus told him, come, I will have meal with you. Just the fact having meal with Zacchaeus, it broke that stigma of shame and honor. Think about the Samaritan woman. Even she was surprised. You talk to me? I am a woman. I am a Samaritan, etc. And Jesus did not, did, not, did not preach to her. He started. He took the initiative. He said, can I have a glass of water? He broke that, that stigma. The woman who had bleeding issue for 12 years, the leper, etc., 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 and many biblical figures. So what is the point? Point is focus more on who people are, not, some, not simply what they do. There is no me apart from the vast network of relationship. No one is truly an individual and independent person. People's actions are interconnected. Many Westerners see identity in terms of uniqueness and differences. Non-Westerner stresses a collective identity, just like I shared with you my own experience. Up to now, I am considered the outsider after 15 years. Even though I go, I share meal with them, but I am still outsider. I am not the Syrian Orthodox monk anymore. In evangelism, both collective and individual identity are true and important. We are created as individuals, yet by baptism, we became part of the, of the family of God. See that? Both of them are important. So start a conversation by talking about their relationships. Who are their functional saviors? Which relationships are regarded as most fundamental? Who are the insiders and outsiders and why? How do people identify themselves? In the process, you will find out what matters most to people. You will likely uncover their most treasured idols. Also, you will better identify passages that best communicate gospel truth. The gospel changes our fundamental identity. When we join God's family, no ethnicity, gender, title, not even social media determines our most basic identity. We get new identity are being honored as children of God and heirs of his kingdom. Last one, learn their sources of praise and appraise. I created like a rhyming, praise and appraise, like the Arab poetry. Find out to whom it is that people most want to please. Whose praises or criticism do they care about? A Chinese idiom says it well. People want face like a tree wants bark. People want face like a tree wants bark. Why? Because one's face refers to how people value him or her. We could use other words like respect, reputation. Therefore, having a shining face, as the Arabic language ex expresses it, it is critical. Maybe this explains why a fifth of the world population is on Facebook. That's why, see, we are imprisoned in that Facebook and how many Twitters and how many likes and how many etc. However, the gospel exposes the danger of praising and appraising someone based on the number of his or her Twitters or Facebook followers. Okay, I'm sorry, Dr. Maya, but I know you are followed by many. <laughs> this doesn't mean that seeking praise and honor is bad. Instead, for the one who believes the gospel, his Praise is not from man, but from God. Jesus prayed, the glory that you have given me, I have given them that they may be one as we are one. Conclusion. Let me give you two concluding points. Number one, our ministry should transform, not conform. Our ministry should transform, not conform. 
when our ministry doesn't transform the community but simply conforms to the existing pattern or structure, we fall in the trap of what is called syncretism. Contextualizing the gospel. That, I, I mentioned that, I talked about that, I saw the need. But what does it mean? How do we balance? Contextualizing the gospel does not mean allowing the culture to be the normative. Scripture, not culture, should be the normatives. I believe it is helpful to contextualize the gospel in evangelism. We should, like Jesus and Paul, look for natural bridges to our audience. We should speak a language they understand. We should meet them on their own turf. We should be clear about the gospel by drawing on cultural sensitivity or even felt need. The gospel speaks to all these. But that does not mean we should co-op Christian discipleship into the value of a given culture. We must never downplay the law of Christ or the centrality of obedience as his disciples. If a host culture diminishes disobedience or lacks category for transgressions, the solution isn't to sidestep the issue. It is to teach believers that to honor Jesus means to follow in his steps. Thank you very much. Wow, that's wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Baku. You will have opportunity to engage with Dr. Baku during the uh, 3.30 sectional session. And so even though you're probably looking at your clock and uh, uh, we are actually on schedule a little bit early. How about that for shame and honor culture? My committee, it's on my case, you know, you got to make sure we're on time, okay? You know, and so uh, we are doing well. We are doing well. And so uh, it, it's uh, uh, wonderful to uh, hear Dr. Baku, and he simply re-emphasized some of the themes that we've been uh, talking about here, especially as we uh, revised the EIT program. How are we going to assess the things that we teach, we do, we write here, and uh, the themes that we've uh, been emphasized as biblically grounded, confessionally sound, and contextually appropriate. Uh, those of you that are my students, uh, this is a broken record uh, for you, I'm sure, and uh, Dr. Baku demonstrate that very well. And so, Let's uh, continue to move on, and I would like to invite uh, uh, Vicky back to introduce our next uh, sponsor. Well, hello again. Once again, it is my great pleasure to introduce a representative from our next sponsor. Lutheran Church Extension Fund provides financial services for LCMS ministries and members, and again, they are our next sponsor. Uh, we do want to thank the Extension Fund for helping to make this event possible. And so now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Casey Carlson, who is Vice President for the Lutheran Church Extension Fund's Missouri District, to the podium. He is risen. I always love when I can do that in front of a crowd. Um, greetings to all you in the name of our uh, risen Lord Jesus Christ from all of us at Lutheran Church Extension Fund. We are so pleased and happy to be a part of this uh, few days here and able to support it. Um, Lutheran Church Extension Fund exists really for one primary purpose, and that's to help uh, uh, ministries thrive and grow in many different ways. A lot of us know us because 
of the funding capabilities we have, and that's, we're able to do that because investors, uh, dating all the way back, goes back to 1978, but really the idea of a Lutheran, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund dates back to the early 1900s when um, a small congregation, uh, I fail to remember the name, but in Virginia, uh, a, a congregation, couple of congregations raised $400 to start a school. And that's where the birth of the Lutheran Church Extension Fund really technically started. Now, fast forward to today, 40 years uh, in, in ministry uh, directly with LCMS congregations, we now have $1.8 billion in assets and $1.5 uh, billion in loans outstanding to congregations, schools, RSOs, all across uh, the country, all across uh, the world, uh, internationally as well. And that's all we're all able to do that because of um, investors, uh, fellow Lutherans, and technically non-Lutherans, you have to be a Lutheran organization uh, for us to lend to you, but you just got to believe in Jesus to, to invest with us. And so you'd be surprised at how many individuals uh, maybe don't have Lutheran ties, but park their money uh, with a Lutheran Church Extension Fund, get a great return on those dollars, knowing full well that those dollars are being turned around to fund and help ministries grow. Um, and that's what our primary charge is. But out, so a lot of you know a lot of us look at, look at LCF as that place to put dollars and know it's going out in ministry and that it's going to go out in loans. But there's so much other things that Lutheran Church Extension, do, Extension Fund does to help support congregations and walk alongside them. Uh, when it comes to vision, visioning and strategic planning, we have a group that has specialists that help walk alongside congregations and work, not, not come out there and say, here's your vision. It's, it's really a consultative approach to it to get to know the congregation, get the congregation talking about what is it that God has called us to do in this part of the kingdom to carry out his mission. Um, so that, that's done through a ministry support group called uh, 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 Mission Clarity, uh, Vision Path. There's a couple of different modules that go along with that. Um, also as simple as uh, demographics. Um, I actually had a conversation with a congregation here in uh, rural Missouri on my drive over here this morning uh, that they're pulling demographics um, their belief and understanding of their community is that it's a very heavily Catholic uh, community. So uh, the pastor wants to pull demographics um, to see if that bears out. Is that true? Is, that, is our assumption correct in what our community is? Um, and so through Mission Insight, we're able to not only pull general demographics of who the people are, uh, backgrounds, ethnicity, uh, jobs, all that kind of stuff, education, but also there's a couple of reports within there that will dig into uh, that specific search area of who these people are from a religious standpoint. So if they're attending church, why are they going? Um, what is their belief in Jesus? Um, and then also there's a separate report that uh, keys in on the people that uh, classify themselves as non-religious. Why aren't they going? Or if they are religious, why aren't they attending their congregations? So those are great ways uh, that we walk alongside congregations as well. And actually with that conversation uh, with the pastor this morning on the way over here, he also mentioned how he's looking to hopefully their small congregation uh, there's a, uh, in the neighboring community, there's a larger congregation as a school um, that they're hoping, um, you know, he wants to start the conversation with them on can we partner in, uh, you know, in this rural area and maybe dream big and, and have a, a high school, a future kind of uh, rural uh, area high school uh, for, for Lutheran education to continue uh, beyond just the K through 8 that they're supporting. Uh, and then one last piece that we do um, help support uh, the, 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 the greater church bodies through our Kaleidoscope grant. Um, that's a granting program that we started uh, about three years ago. I've given um, over $2 million in grants over the last three years. Um, and uh, this year, it just opened April 1st. This year is specifically geared towards um, congregations, and, uh, congregations with schools K through 8. Um, and the reason we did that is the last, uh, last year I can speak to directly. Uh, when we opened it up, we got $60 million in requests. Um, to give out about a million dollars that we that we target each year to give annually. Uh, so we tried to pinpoint that and, and try to, it, it's hard to get that much dollars and have to say no to that many people. So we're trying to see if we can target to a certain area and Lutheran education being so very, very dear to uh, not only our hearts at LCF, but just within our church body as a whole. So uh, if you're serving or know of congregations that have uh, that K-3-8 school, uh, look out. Uh, if you go to lcf.org actually right now, it's going to pull up Kaleidoscope uh, uh, grant right away. Uh, feel free to check that out. Um, we also, I have some information um, out on the table, out in the, the vendor row. Unfortunately, with the conflicting schedule, we're going to try to have people in and out, but if, there, if there's not some at the table, I have my cards there. There's plenty of stuff. Uh, please uh, gra uh, grab anything uh, and continue to uh, 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 
you can go to lcf.org or my card's there. Feel free to shoot me an email. So again, so happy to be here and so pleased uh, and uh, very honored what God has blessed us with to serve the, uh, serve, uh, the greater church body uh, with LCF. So God bless.